There's bad radio, good radio, and chaotic radio. In that order. show about football and soccer and how women can impact the world's beautiful game. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we're on Facebook Live. You can also call in at 909-360-8330 if you have any questions. That's the call-in number, 909-360-8330. Um, tonight, we have an awesome guest, um, my good friend, Reed Maltby, who is the executive director of Soccer Shots San Diego, is going to be calling in. I'm in the studio alone, so once again, it looks like I'm talking to myself, but um, we're going to have a great show tonight. Reed uh, has a great story, and we're going to talk tonight about creating club culture. Um, we're going to talk tonight about creating the warrior brain, not winners, which sounds a little odd in a competitive sport. And we're also going to talk about an awesome book called Legacy, which we can all utilize within our coaching and within our clubs. And it's, it's all about how, we, how to create a team and club culture. So do we have Reed on the line, Mike? Uh, yeah, we are ready to go. Awesome. Reed, are you there? Hello? Hi, how are you? <coughs> Reed, thank you so much for calling in. It's, it's so great to have you on the show. Um, let's just start off right now. Can you just tell me a little bit about your background? I know we've had our past kind of cross in different cities and, and different things like that, but just give us, give us a little, uh, insight into where you've been and what you've done in the game of soccer. Sure. We'll do. Well, yeah, as you know, I followed you around. I, I coached in Cincinnati for a while. Uh, now I'm in San Diego coaching. Uh, started my career when I was 16. I've coached, uh, youth soccer. Uh, all the way up through the competitive levels. I've also coached a little bit of college. I was part of the Cincinnati Saints professional team, so I got to that level too. Uh, but my heart's always been with the children, so now I'm out in San Diego uh, as executive director of Soccer Shots East San Diego, <clears throat> and we are the, ch the child's first soccer experience, so I deal with ages 2 to 9. Most of these children have never played soccer before, so it's all about building that proper foundation of love for the game and instilling the passion uh, the values to allow them to succeed beyond the game, and of course, uh, skills as well. That's that's great. How are you liking uh, San Diego in California? Oh my goodness! <laughs> well, my friends in Cincinnati hate me because I'm constantly posting, as they say, sunset and coffee pictures. And I've had people say that you know I'm a bad person for the pictures I post, but <laughs> we love it. I don't know why we didn't move out here sooner. Yeah, well, we're we're glad you're you're out here, and it's good to have some like-minded people in the Southern California area because um, when I first moved out here from Cincinnati, I called it soccer on steroids because it was a crazy, crazy kind of different environment. So I am personally happy to have you out here and, and can't wait to connect and collaborate a little bit more uh, going forward. Oh, I, I, I agree with you completely. There's so many things we can do out here together and it's as you know, it's going to take an army to make the changes we'd like to see. So uh, I'm excited to be in the same town with uh, great thinkers like yourself. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the first I think I heard of you or saw something that you did was your TEDx talk. And what, it's called what? Echoes Beyond the Game? You got it. <laughs> can you can you share so, like just some tidbits from that talk? I was I mean, that it was amazing. And I actually utilized that in a in a speech that I gave later on. I don't know if I ever told you that I, I like stole some of your, your TED talk. But so thank you for that. Um, yeah. Can you just kind of take people through like the key points of that? And again, if if anyone's on and watching on Facebook, you need to check out TEDx Cincinnati Echoes Beyond the Game. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm honored you used it in a talk. Uh, so the, the basic gist of it was that uh, I wanted coaches to understand that our legacy is not the skills we teach. Our legacy is the words that we use. It's, it's what we, the echoes that we create in the minds of our children. So as coaches, we have to be very careful about what we say to them because we have the opportunity to not only build bodies, to, to build skill in children, but to build minds. And if you, for instance, tell a child you believe in them, you light a flame within that child that's going to burn well beyond any game. And so the whole 
speech was centered around what are we doing as coaches to leave a lasting legacy on our children that will go beyond the game? What are we saying to them that empowers them, that elevates them, uh, and that um, you know uh, pushes them to succeed? Because we know this. You and I both are feeling the pain these days. At some point in time, the game stops, the ball stops rolling. And so our obligation as coaches is not just to create soccer players. Our obligation is to create people that will succeed for the, after that ball stops rolling. And that was the basic gist of it. Yeah, I mean, it's a phenomenal talk, so I, I, I highly recommend it. And I, th- and I think, you know, we, we need as coaches and as club directors and executive directors, I think the more we can spread the message to the parents about the, the game ends eventually, you know, and it, it's not, trust me, it's not like, I don't remember scores from eighth grade or ninth grade. I remember memories. I remember my teammates. I remember, you know, the bus rides and things like that. And, and I, I think we've lost our path a little bit on what we're doing within our club system pr- primarily. And we need to like reinvest in more of these soft skill type things. What do you, what do you think about that? I completely agree with you. And, and a lot of times in my talks, I will put up a slide that shows uh, at one point in time, we had this really beautiful curio cases uh, in our house. And my wife said, you can get three of the, we were using the bottom two shelves for our China, our wedding China. And she said, you can have the other three shelves because it was near where I worked for whatever you want, all your trophies. And so I took days painstakingly filling this thing. And when I show the pictures and the talks, everybody laughs because there's not a single trophy on any of those three shelves. It's ticket stubs and, and event um, manuals and, and, and notes from players and pictures. patches from when I played. Yeah. And it's just it's the memories. And I, and I call it my memory case because at some point in time, the trophies get dusty and rusty and we pitch them. But it's the memories that we create. It's these, these exciting moments in these children's lives that really matter more. And I think we... I'm not going to say we miss the boat because we're doing a great job of training coaches, but sometimes we, we miss the soft skills and being a coach is being an educator. And so as club directors, uh, when I was at star back in Cincinnati, one of my biggest focuses was not, I knew the coaches could search online for all the sessions they wanted and they could go to licensing courses and all of that. So when we did our coaches clinics, we tried to focus on communication skills, mindset, how to build the right culture, how to instill values, uh, even down to the pieces of like how to create a progression throughout a season so the children are in a proper learning environment. Those are the soft skills that we miss. It's funny that you mentioned creating that progression throughout the season with the, with the mental and, and, and training training their minds. And, and that's that's something that, that I've tried to do with my high school team a little bit. And today, today was like our midpoint in our season. And – I, I've been like planting the seeds and not telling the, the team kind of what we're doing or where we're going. And today, like we had one of those moments where, you know, I was telling them a story and it all kind of came together and you could almost see like the light bulbs go on and they're like, oh, okay, I get what you've been doing for the past like month and a half now. And it's, it's cool. I mean, it's, it's amazing to see those light bulbs go on in the players' minds of, oh, okay, well that, that, that's what that's why we're here or, or that's what that meant and that that's the thing I think as I get older I, I appreciate that more and I understand it more and it's more impactful not only for me but for the players I feel too I totally agree I love watching your videos on Facebook of what you're doing with your team and you make the joke like we do actually play soccer too but the team building the culture building it's I mean it plays right into legacy yeah and, and as you, you know as you know it's the light bulb does go on at some point. It takes time to build culture in your athletes, but uh, you touched on story. And I, I was just going to say, I, I used to coach with a guy back in Cincinnati that we would, <clears throat> we had the, the three elite level teams within our club, the top three teams out of like, you know, 10 or 12 teams. And <clears throat> I had the top and he had the third and his job was to close the gap. And, and, right. um, and, and I told him he was, my, he was the most important coach that he had because there, there's a development gap based on age and developmental cycles and children. And we always forget those, those third team players because we're going for our biggest, fastest, strongest, whatever. But that third team player will someday be potentially your bet, your better player in your club developmentally as he grows into his body or she grows into the development cycle. And so he is one of the things he did though, to close the gap was he, focused on the mental game with the kids. And so at the end of every training session, he would tell a story and the story was always connected to a value or a habit or a belief that he wanted his players to have. And I loved when he would do that. And everybody would always 
you know, poo poo it and say, well, why are you wasting so much time at the end? But it was such a cool thing to watch these young men grow under these stories he was creating. And a lot of those kids are no longer 13 players because he built into them with that. Yeah, that, that, that's the thing. I think, again, in, within the youth game, if I hear the word elite one more time, <laughs> I think I'm going to throw up because we, I think we missed the boat on the other 90, you know, 7% of the kids that play. And, and yeah, so those third team players, like you said, you have to invest in them. And you, I mean, they're, they're just as important as, you know, who's that first team player at that particular moment, because kid, I mean, kids peak at different levels and ages for sure. Um, oh, I, can I share a quick story with you about that? Absolutely. So I was in Colorado this past summer at the uh, Colorado Amateur Hockey Association, and, and uh, who was it? Was it Joe Bonnet from – he was at Miami University when I was there, which is really crazy. He's with USA Hockey now. And okay. so I gave my talk, and then Joe followed up a little bit later with his talk, and he was talking about the development cycle, and he had some really cool stuff, but he was basically showing what USA Hockey has done with its long-term athletic development plan mm -hmm. over the last few years. And, you know, in 2000, I think it was four, they revamped everything because the focus was on outcomes and not on process. And USA Hockey really did, took a lot of time to say, you know, to figure out the, what was happening. Kids are leaving. You know, they're not developing. We're, we're running them out of the sport, so what do we do to fix it? But he tells this really cool story. He says that they went over to Finland, I believe it was, and studied what they were doing over Finland because they were blowing everybody out of the water at the youth ranks, and it was all about culture, and it was all about development, and it was all about you know what they were doing with, the, with, the, with all of the players, not the top 1%. Right. And then Finland came over and did the same thing. They did an exchange. And he said they were at this session, and this coach gets done with a tryout, and it's like 200 kids at the tryout. And the coach is standing there bragging to the Finnish coaches about how he took the top 20 best kids out of all 200, and these are these are the grinders, these are the meat eaters, this is going to be the team. And the one Finnish coach raises his hand and says, well, what about the other 180? And the coach says, I don't care. I got took the best 20. And he goes, but they're 12. What about the other 180? He goes, it doesn't matter. I, I took the best team. We're going to beat everybody. And he goes, but you left 180 bodies on the table. Right. And who knows where those kids could go? He says, in Finland, we train them all. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and that, I mean, that's a good, that's the message that we ne need to continue to send, you know. We, you can't leave 12-year-olds on the table. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because they're going to, they're important. They're very important. Um, earlier, you, I, I love what you did with your language. You were talking about male pronouns in describing mm -hmm. a player or a coach and then you stuck in the female pronoun so thank you for that because language is so 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 important to me as a female coach because I feel like players and coaches often everything's framed in the male pronoun and and how how important is that language how important is what we use the language that we use as coaches to it's very important the impact that we have it's very important. As you can see, I, I have a, you know, I, I'm sort of under the gun twice because one, we, we have grown up in a male dominated environment and, and it's, and it's tough to overcome some of those pieces. But two, I am a guy, so my perspective is male. And so I think in the he pronoun. And so I struggle to get over that and you can see, but language is extremely important because, uh, Women and men develop differently at different rates of speed. Uh, the brains develop differently. Um, they see and feel things differently. And when we start using an all-male pronoun uh, dominated environment, we're cutting out, a, you know, the, the whole female part of the population. We're not, we're not feeding into what they need. Uh, and secondly, we're setting them up for what our culture already has in mind for them. You know, if you go back and you look at the 50s and 60s and the pamphlets on how to be a good housewife and all this, <laughs> when we speak to our female players in certain ways, we're already setting them up. I mean, it's, it's, it's simple as hearing a male coach tell his male players, that's the weakest kick I've ever seen, why don't you hit with your purse? What you just said is women are weak, and right. that's false. And what you've created, again, is this environment of pitting men against the women and, and putting men as, as dominant. Um, you know this because you coached at Mount St. Joe, and, and you, Joseph, and you dealt with this, right? It's, yeah. there, our language sets up a belief system. Language drives connection between people. It's, we're, the, we're the only animal on the planet that has such a sophisticated language to be able to connect at a deeper level. We should stop using it to dominate one um, gender over the other. We should start using that language to grow both sides. And so it's for, and I know we're getting really deep into it, but from a coach's perspective, you have got to, to be a little bit more gender neutral in your coaching 
because you just don't know what your words do as far as putting people in boxes, right. shutting people down, and eliminating risk behaviors, or even just not building that confidence into them. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And, and I think, I mean, I do a lot of coaching. Well, I wouldn't say a lot, but I do coaching education. And um, I was actually taking a course in March, and we were talking about language. And I raised my hand and I said, well, now that you're bringing up language, um, may I point out the fact that all of the instructors keep saying him, his, and, and like it's all male pronouns. And you would have thought like I was speaking Chinese and, and the room was about to erupt. And it, it, it ended up being a good conversation, but I don't know. I don't know if like ten years ago I would have put my hand up and, and pointed that out. And there were four other women in the room, and and I, I, I got the little silent claps, and we went into the bathroom together like women do. And they were like, "Good job, thanks for speaking up." So, but it, but it is important, and and I think it's not. I think a lot of men don't do it consciously. It's that unconscious bias. And, and they don't realize the impact that it has. So we need to point out the impact that it has so that we all try to use better wor- use our words better, I guess, is the best way to say, say it. Oh, definitely. I mean, it's even like little things. I've, I've, for years, I would hear coaches, they would refer, I coached in high school for a while, and they would refer to the, I coached the men's team, and they would refer to them to the, as the men's. And then you hear somebody say, the men's teams play on Tuesday and Thursday, but the girls' teams, they play on Wednesday. You know, Monday, Wednesday, or whatever, and I say, why is it men and girls? Haven't you created a, 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 you know, disempowerment there? I mean, haven't you made one group seem more important than the other because you're using girls for one group and men for other? And people looked at me like I was strange. I'm just saying, it's there's a power struggle there. And if you're going to say men, you're going to say women. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) From a women's perspective, you're hearing these words. They're imprinting on the brain. They're creating uh, pathways in the brain, and 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 so it's. I'm a, I'm a brain and word geek. And I just think that there's gotta be more gender equality. Yeah, no, for, for sure. I was, I was at a DOC's meeting a couple of months ago and I was sitting next to Shannon McMillan who, you know, has won a world championship. And this gentleman looked at us and called us girls and we looked at each other. We're like, did that just really happen? <laughs> like, oh we, we, I think we've earned the term woman yeah. by this time in our lives and our careers. So yeah, it's it's a battle. We we need to. It's a challenge. We need to educate and continue to to point it out and and and, and fix it a little bit. So, talk to me a little bit more about the warrior brain. I know you're you're working on some things there, and you've written some articles about warriors, not winners. What's that all about? Sure. So, the warrior brain is unlocking uh, in the brain that the there. I believe I believe that there are different centers of the brain that you can activate based on the words you use and these words or phrases or how we speak to our children when we activate those centers we're also attaching values to them and so I have a talk actually coming up at the NSCA where we and I did it at parent university or up at Brentwood uh, school in LA uh, and I expanded on it for NSCA and it's really fascinating to start to think about how we speak to people and we can grow a warrior's brain but the idea is it comes back to the reason why I use warrior brain is it comes back to this thought process of warriors, not winners. And the idea is that right now, a lot of us are focused on outcomes. We're creating winners. And the problem with winners is they're seeking an external reward that is fleeting and that has to be redone each week. And someday that winning will stop. And, uh, if they don't, you know, it's the whole mindset idea. It's fixed. Whereas warrior brains, warriors are the, are the kind of people that have an internal drive. Their reward is not ex- external, it's internal. They drive, they're, they're competing for a purpose, right. not a, a trophy. And warriors are the kind that never stop. There is no end to what they do because that, that why is always out there, that purpose. As you know, Sir Edmund Hillary said when they asked him, why did you climb Mount Everest? He said, because it was there. Right. It, I mean, that, that's a warrior's mentality. And so if you start to think about him and compare him, you look at a Steph Curry. Steph Curry was told he could never succeed in the NBA, so he goes and does it. And then he decides in the offseason, after his greatest season ever in the MVP, he says, that's not good enough. There's a deeper purpose. There's a greater meaning. I'm going to drive even further. And then he goes and shoots the lights out with three-pointers. Like, he perfects the three-pointer to the point where they're saying it's going to take 10 years for the rest of the NBA to catch up 
to the numbers he put up. Right. That's a warrior. Michael Jordan conquers basketball with six NBA championships and then says, I'm going to go try another sport. You see, winners, once they reach the top of the mountain, they're done. Right. They got their trophy. But warriors say, where's the next mountain? And that's why Michael Jordan tried baseball. Tim Tebow is now trying baseball because they've got that mindset that's always competing for this inner glory, this inner purpose. And if you look at the All Blacks, they're warriors. They fight for each other. There's a shared value and shared mission, and there's a why behind what they do. They don't just play to play. There's a deeper why. They play with purpose. Right. So you mentioned the All Blacks, and, and for anybody listening, they, you might not know who the All Blacks are. So the All Blacks are the New Zealand um, men's rugby team, and they've had tremendous success, and they have great culture, and there's a book about them. And we're going to talk about that book in the second part. Of the of our hours, um, but but it's so yeah, it's absolutely so important. And I th- the the word choice and empowering athletes to not focus on the outcome um, is, is key. And and I'll I'll share a story um, from that happened to me last night. I'm in the middle of my high school girls season, and we're still out of school. So I was missing ten players from my team last night. And I'm the type of high school coach, I don't mandate that you're in town during the holiday because, whoa, I actually believe that kids can have a life outside of soccer. So we, we Crazy should, talk. I know, right? Like, hey, you make a choice, you go on a ski trip, it's all good. We're going to be here and we're going to battle, like, I, like you mentioned, with the warriors that we got. And I, I actually used that word last night when we were, like, kind of doing our pregame talks because we showed up. 13 players we had a game and two of the 13 players honestly haven't gotten a lot of playing time and some of the girls I could I could tell were like what are we gonna do what are we gonna do and I was like we got it we're good you know hey we're prepared we're a team let's let's go out and battle and um, I actually used a a quote from the book the legacy that the strength of of the wolf is the pack and the strength of of the pack is the wolf and they kind of looked at me and I went, well, we're dolphins, so, like, just relate it to our, our mascot. And they're like, okay, yeah, we get it. We get it, coach. Well, we ended up tying 0-0, which I hate ties. But the outcome was just fine because every single player got to contribute. And, and it was just it was awesome to sit back and watch and go, okay, you know what? Two people that didn't get a, a lot of playing time in the previous games really stepped up and battled for the team. And, and we were okay. And the girls felt really good about the game after the game and and you know we didn't focus on the outcome i don't talk about winning we talk about you know can we play our best what can we do better what can what can we impact you know can we do our best and if we walk off the field and you've done your best then that's all you can do and we've only lost one game all season so some something small is working i guess a little bit but i have talented players too so i just stay out of their way a little bit (laughs) and that's what the great coaches do they, sure. they know they recognize talent and they empower it to do what it's supposed to do and then get the heck out of the way, right? <laughs> yeah, but you know, I haven't always been that way. I, I've made made flubs along the way, but I'm learning. I'm getting I'm getting to be a smarter, more educated, evolved soccer coach. So, well, you and I were talking about that via text earlier. I mean, that's we learn as the players learn. It's amazing to, to look at the parallel journey we take where we made all kinds of rookie mistakes and then we learned from them. We fell down, we got up, we tweaked it, we analyzed it, and then we started to evolve our game and get a little bit better each each and every day, marginal gains as coaches, and now we're passing that on to our players, right? We're teaching our players to evolve the same way, and it's kind of, it's if you don't, if you stop learning, you stop living. You've, you've stopped being a coach. Is that in the book, The Legacy? I think I'd read that earlier. <laughs> I think it is. I think he says, I think it's Graham Henry that says, uh, what is it? Uh, and Bill Walsh actually said it too, where it's um, uh, the greatest uh, the greatest coach is a learner or something like that. Learn- leaders are learners. Yeah, 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 yeah. Leaders are learners. Yeah. Oh. A- absolutely. So you're involved in a lot of different things. So what do you, talk to me about what you're doing with, um, with changing the game and John O'Sullivan, because I know a lot of, soccer people out there have heard of John and, and what he's doing. Can you can you kind of share what you're doing with Changing the Game Project? Yes. So John, right after my TEDx came out, actually, John um, tweeted at me and said, private message me, we need to chat. 
And I'm, I, of course, being a geek and a learner, I, I watched everything. I read Carmine Gallo's book, Talk Like Ted. I watched all the great TED Talks, Ken Robinson, all of them. And then I watched all of the ones like John O'Sullivan, the TEDx Talks that were just brilliant talks, especially from a soccer guy. So I knew who he was. And I'm like, you know, I said to my wife, I said, John O'Sullivan, John O'Sullivan is telling me he wants to talk to me. So I call him and I'm on the phone with him. I'm pointing at the phone. I'm like, it's John O'Sullivan on the phone, honey. And she's laughing at me. Um, John basically said, look, I like what you're doing, and, and we're very similar in our approach and everything. And he said, I want you to come in with me, and, and, and let's do this together because he believes in a world of abundance. And rather than you know us compete with each other to go out and give talks, he said, I'd rather help you and, and say and shortcut how long it's going to take you to actually become a speaker. He said, so speak on my behalf, on, on behalf of my company changing the game, right. and and go out and, and, and you know create your brand under that. And so for the last year, I've been traveling around um, speaking as a member of the Changing the Game speaking team, and uh, John opened all kinds of doors for me. Uh, he got me into the Brentwood School this past uh, um, fall, which if, you know, if you're on the West Coast, you of course know that it's, that's a pretty good school to go speak, speak right. in, in front of, and um, he's just opened all kinds of doors. He's taught me all kinds of things. Every time we talk, he teaches me something new. He says, Reed, you need to do this. Reed, you, you, know, you need to work on this. Um, you know, like from my marketing perspective and everything. And so I'm a member of the Changing the Game speaking team, um, which is a real honor to be a part of anything John O'Sullivan's doing. But more importantly, he's he's helped me sort of hone my message and, and kind of figure out where I belong. Right. And, of course, uh, the more I speak for him, the more I realize that I'm, I'm a communications and culture guy. That's what I am. And so he's usually, anytime he has somebody that says they want to work on culture or they really want to talk with their organization about communication, I'm the guy he sends, and uh, it's been a real honor and pleasure to work with him. Yeah, my my club we brought at Laguna United. We brought him in twice to uh, to have him speak with our parents and our coaches, and and it was phenomenal. He he's at the convention as well, correct? He'll be out there. Yes, yeah. he's got a handful of talks. Uh, Sky Eddie Bruce is a member of the Changing the Game speaking team. She's got a handful of talks. Uh, last year it was, I believe, just John and Sky and John and I were at the conference together of the convention together, and it was really cool to hang out and sort of watch John do his thing. And this year, it's like, oh, my gosh, all three of us are speaking at the convention. This is really cool. Yeah. So when is your um, – for the listeners, the National Soccer Coaches Association is having a, their massive yearly convention. This time it's in L.A., uh, January what 11th through the 15th um, at, the yes. conven- at the convention center. And what it is, it, it's field sessions, it's um, classroom sessions – talks, networking. It's the largest soccer coaches gathering, I think, in the world, maybe. I don't know. Maybe I'm making that claim up, but uh, it's amazing. And my my first club coach that I worked for, or club director, made us go to it. He paid for it. The club paid for it. He made us go to it every year. So I've, I've gone to a million of them, but it's it's so important if you're a coach and that you want to learn and, and and continue to educate yourself. So I'm excited that my club is supporting our coaches and we're actually bringing um, 12 coaches to the convention. So I'm pumped to be able to pass that back to my coaches because I had somebody open that door and say, you must go to this, you must attend it because it's awesome. So I'm excited, can't wait to go. Uh, I'm excited with you. I'm so I'm so excited. Your club is taking twelve people. I have to chat with you about strategy of who to send where, so we can all compare notes. <laughs> yeah, well, we can we can delegate like who, who goes to what and all sh- and share stories because I think it, it's going to be there's a lot going on. There's a lot of great talks that overlap each other. What what day and time is your talk? I'm embarrassed to say that I was on I was on Anthony Tatera's red card show earlier, and he asked me, and I couldn't remember the time. What? Um, I was so busy building the talks that I didn't pay attention to when my times were. I'm uh, Friday the 13th woo, Uh-oh. at uh, 9.30 a.m. in CC 503, I believe. It's my Warriors Not Winners culture uh, talk. And then, uh, again, at 1.15 in the same room the same day is my Echoes Beyond the Game talk. Awesome. Well, I will have to try to check those out. Um, I'm actually excited. I'm get presenting uh, on Saturday in room 504 at 245 for, for U.S. youth. And uh, my topic is called Managing Talent. Um, so I'm talking about our coaches and how to keep and retain and hire the right people. So 
Yes, I love it. Yeah. Um, we're going to go on a little quick two-minute break. So, Reed, stay on the line, and we will come right back to you in two minutes. Okay? <laughs> It's raw, it's uncensored, it's live 24-7, it's chaoticradio.com. And welcome back to 
chaoticradio.com. I'm Carrie Taylor, your host for Women Talking Football, a show about uh, football, aka soccer, and how women can impact the world's most beautiful game. Um, we have my friend Reed Maltby uh, still on the line, and we're talking about multiple things tonight. We're talking about creating the warrior brain, not winners. We're talking about club culture, and we will be hitting on multiple concepts from the book Legacy, which is an amazing book. So I'm not getting paid to plug the book, but it's a great, fantastic book about the New Zealand uh, national rugby team, the All Blacks. So, Reed, um, let's talk creating club culture. Ready, set, go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a big one, huh? <laughs> where, do we, where do we start? Like, here, here's my thing. Being within the youth soccer game right now as a club DOC, and this, th- it, this pains me to say it, but I almost feel like we need to scrap club soccer and start from scratch because there's so much wrong that I feel that what's right is so that message is so hard to get through to people right now and, and that's just me that's not me talking as a club director that's me Carrie Taylor my own thoughts and I mean how, how do we how do we fix or how do we create better cultures within our youth soccer clubs so I'm going to be trite and, and quote Simon Sinek Kay. we need to start with why and it's in the, it's obviously it's in the legacy uh, book as well. A lot of our clubs are built around the wrong why. Why do you exist? Why do you coach? Why are you a club? You know what is your existence there for? What is your purpose? And a lot of them are built around scholarships, right. and trophies, and ego, revenue, and resume. The coaching error, E R R, ego, revenue, and resume. If that's why we're in it, then we're already on the wrong track. So we need to readjust our why. It's like like, like I said, I got out of it. Um, partially because I was like you, it's, it's, it was, I was Don Quixote chasing down windmills. It right. was, you know, it was, it's, it, and it's white noise. What I was saying was being drowned out by all the white noise of, of people misunderstanding what it's all about. And so they're following the wrong cause or the, you know, people being louder than me that were quieting me down. And so it's just like, I'm, I'm done with it. So I went to soccer shots. Why did I go to soccer shots? Cause soccer shots mission actually lined up perfectly. My mind's been beyond the game since like 2006. Right. What's Soccer Shot's lo- uh, slogan? Strengthening youth beyond the game. I said, well, there's where I want to go because they have the right why. You know, our Everest is all about these children and what we're doing for them. And so uh, I think that's the first thing we need to do is start looking at club cultures and the- redefining the why, and then you build everything from that why. Right. I, I mean, absolutely. And, and that, I mean, in listening to you speaking and listening to John O'Sullivan speaking and in going to – you know, other educational events, uh, this, this idea kept coming back. And, and I, I went to a, a LA 84 foundation had a, had a, uh, get together a, a little symposium. And, and I went to that and listened to former Olympians and, and just all these amazing people. And they talked about the three values of the Olympics and it really, really resonated with me. They talked about the, the three values that, the, that everyone in the world embraces every four years. And those values were respect, excellence, and friendship. And I, it literally like, like took me back. And I sat back in my seat and I went, there it is. Like personally for, for my club, I was like, there it is. That, those are three values that I can set and and get my staff to buy into and get the parents to buy into because if the world can buy into those three values every four years why why can't that be what our club is about because it it's obviously you know ingrained within sports it's obviously a powerful message and it and it kind of describes who we are so then I took that and I went, okay, what's my mantra? What, what's going to be that tagline that we believe in and can align with and that my coaches can, can say over and over and over again? And it, took, it literally took me like two months to, to, to come up with it. And what I came up with and that even my staff doesn't know I'm launching this month is Laguna United is a thriving community-based learning center. And... I repeated that to a mentor of mine and, and his, his response to me was, I'm in, I'd send my kids there. 
And for me, it wasn't about like getting people in. It was like, okay, <laughs> that's what that's what we're about, and that's what we can align everything that we do with. That's what we can point to. And when something goes, you know, off kilter, we can always point back to that and say, hey, are we in line with with what we're about? And so I'm li- I'm like super ex- I'm so excited for like my staff and the club just to just to get on board and, and push this and drive this. So I, I hope everyone's as excited about it as I am, but I've, 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 I've located our why, I think. I hope. <laughs> I hope it works. <laughs> well, you know I'm excited for you because I just I love the concept of a learning center because it, it embodies not just your athletes but your coaches, that everybody is going to learn together, grow together. And, and as you know, those three values can come up in legacy. Yeah. They do. So, so I highlighted it. I, I highlighted it. <laughs> Respect and excellence. You know I was like, ah, there it is. It's in legacy too. The yeah, fr- and friendship is in there too because they talk about uh, uh, the rugby club and and the idea that there's a connection between the players off the field and that the connection is just as important. So there's your friendship piece right there. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I'm I'm pumped about it, and and we're we're gonna get behind it, and I. I'm rolling it out to my coaches, and I I hope I, I believe I, I believe that I have the the staff that can get behind it because we we have a great staff. I'm super pumped. So awesome! I'm I'm and you and I talked a little bit. About, I am so excited to, for the future for your club uh, because you're doing it the right way. And I'm I'm venturing a guess, and I'm probably wrong, but I'm wondering if that mentor is Sam Snow because it, I read his mission statement. He sent it to me, and and it's th- exactly that. <laughs> It's not Sam, but I'm I I will share it with Sam when I see him at the convention. But he'll love it. <laughs> yeah, no, it it it's great. So, so after you find your why within your club culture, then what do you what do you recommend as the next steps are? What do you what do you think? What do you? So I'm I'm big on and you know I just wrote that article on Commander's Intent. I'm big on the idea that the why is going to drive the other pieces of the puzzle. And if we want to be kitschy and use the you know the who what when where why the why is going to drive the what so once we have our why once we have that that shared purpose which again i'm not going to go back like i i you know most clubs it'll come out because everybody has to have a a ownership piece of it so i'm not going to i wouldn't go back for instance my old club i went to all the coaches and the players and everybody else and i started watching them and taking notes and i kept writing down values i saw being lived each day and then i asked them what are our values what matters most to you and so those values become the what. That's the game plan. You're going to live out the why through these values, which sort of become your, your uh, soul of your, your organization, uh, your DNA. And then those values should drive everything you do. Because remember, they link back to the why, the commander's intent. Those values should drive everything you do. So everything you do, hiring, yep. firing, training, evaluating, uh, promoting, all of those should link back to your values. At Soccer Shops, what we did is we took our – five core values and we built like a Parthenon like structure. We have four pillars in the rooftop. The rooftop is mission focused. And then our four pillars are the other four major values that we share as an organization that we try to live and breathe every day. Cause you know, there's that fear that values just become something you put on your website and you don't actually live them. Right. And so when we hire somebody, I don't hire them on talent. I hire them on whether they're a cultural fit, whether they share the why with us, and whether they get those values and whether I can see those values just, just leaping off of them across the desk at me as I'm talking to them. If that's the case, I hire them, and then we train them. And the training begins with a, a, a cultural onboarding. And then when they go out on the field and train to become a soccer shots coach, they train based on those pillars, responsibility, genuinely happy, um, passionate, and integrity. And so they go through four or five uh, sessions where they're just learning responsibility, taking attendance, checking numbers of kids, checking them back in the classroom, uh, you know, safety first, how, what a session looks like, the, the process, all of that, the responsibility, the structure, because you know strategy without structure, just like it says in legacy, failure. And then they go through each one of those. So each four of those, they do sessions that are just based solely on those values. And then we decided once that's done, they're now part of the organization. So we were going back and evaluating, and the evaluations had nothing to do with the values. Well, why do we teach them these values to live and breathe if we're not going to do evaluations that aren't based on those? So we revamp the evaluations to say, listen, I'm going to come watch you and I'm going to evaluate you based on mission focus, res- responsibility, passion, all that. And then, of course, that means that you're still living and breathing every day the DNA of the organization, which means we're driving towards that why. 
that that's where I'd go next is how you, you know, infuse that in your everyday activities as an organization. Right. You, one of the key things that I just resonated with me that I heard you mention is, is hiring and firing. And that's a, within the youth club culture, soccer structure, I don't think we, we, and I say we as coaching directors, I don't think it's important enough and I don't think people take time to make sure that they hire the right people and they develop the right people that are out there dealing with with the kids in my in my kind of experience it's more about hey do you have a team can you can you bring in money can you you know like can you wear our jersey here you go like come on in you can coach for us and and that's where I just again I feel like we're, it's a broken system and and that that if if we as people in the game that have these similar ideas if if we can just continue to spread the message and to con- continue to collaborate with like-minded people to get back to the wise then we can fix it a little bit because it's again it's it's spinning out of control and and it's got to be it's got to be it's got to come back to the why it's got it it has to and I totally agree with you. So I think it was uh, Tom, uh, might have been Tom Peters that said that culture eats talent for breakfast. And then, of course, uh, Nick Levitt and Stu Armstrong, or Stu, yeah, and a couple others have repeated it. Talent eats, our culture eats talent, talent for breakfast. We don't hire on culture, we hire on talent. And then we, we don't have a real, if you look at a lot of clubs, again, I'm using the we like you did, um, we have a lot of clubs that don't really have a well defined culture because they never hired the right people for the right seats and they're all over the board. And, and my wife and I were just talking about this. She says, you know, you want to know when you know a club has the right values, has the right mission and is doing it the right way. Look at the peaks and valleys when they're doing everything, when they're at the very highest of their game, they should be living those values and breathing out that why and in the valleys when the bottom falls out, when there's tragedy within your organization, catastrophic events, those values should be coming out. That should be the first thing you see is return to the values and the why. Right. And a lot of clubs have died in those valleys, and a lot of clubs have fallen off those peaks because they don't have a defined culture because they're not hiring based on that cultural fit. Look, it's, it's like the All Blacks. They, they had players that were some of the best players in the nation, and they, didn't, they either didn't make the team or they made it once and they never were invited back because why because better people make better all blacks if you are not a cultural fit you are a rotten orange and you're going to rot the rest of the the basket out right so sorry you're, you're out and the hardest thing i ever did in my career was i fired myself from a club i i was what? at a club for a very long time and i said you know what my why is not your why we are not a cultural fit so i have to move on and it wasn't that their culture was bad but it wasn't a fit for my personal mission. And I knew someday that I, I just was, the buy-in was going to be gone from me. I was going to disengage because it wasn't my mission. So I had to go find a place that had my mission. Yeah, no, I, I've been in that situation and, and I, I've, I've done that similar, similarly, you know, it, there's a, there's another book. I'm, I'm on this book kick. There's another book by John Gordon called the energy boss. And he, he references you know, like how to make sure that, you know, if you're a leader and you're, you're, you're the driver of the bus and you control who you let on your bus. So if there's somebody that's not, on, you know, shouldn't be on your bus, it's up to you to make sure you kick them off and you get the right people on your bus because, you know, the bus isn't going to drive correctly or go in the right direction if there's even one person that's not, you know, that positive energy on your bus. So... Check that. Check out that book. It's a good book. Yeah, I, I definitely have to. I, I, a lot of people talk about John Gordon's books. So I've got to start putting those on the list and reading them. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, let's t- let's talk about this book that we keep talking about, Legacy. And and I know it's odd to have soccer coaches sit and talk about books that they've read, but it, it's it's just it's such a just anchor to everything. And, and I, ironically, you and I were talking the other day and. I mentioned the article "Sweep the Sheds," and, and then and then you were like, "Oh my God, there's this book!" and and it was it was just like this crazy synergy. And so I, I just want to kind of open it up with, with the concept of, of sweeping the shed. So 
A um, couple, two years ago, I there, I read an article and it, it was a it was about the New Zealand rugby team All Blacks and it was called Sweep the Sheds and I read it and I was like this is perfect for my high school girls team, and and basically the premise of the article is that never be too big to do the small things that need to be done and and that's that's the gist of it and the All Blacks after every game or practice they all collectively sweep their shed they clean it up they throw things away and it's it's just a habit and it's done so that they never forget you know you're never too big to to do the little things and you know i thought about i thought about that concept and i i thought okay how can i use this with my high school girls team and how i utilized it was you know within high school cultures there's always that hierarchy of the players that have been on the team a long time and then you have your newcomers that you know everybody picks on and has to carry the equipment and has to move the goals and and it it was just off kilter like our my my team culture when I took it over it was just it was off so I had to do something so I was like okay let me try this so I I slashed the you know newbies have to carry all the equipment I said nope we're not going to do that everybody's going to contribute and apparently the alumni got really pissed off at me I didn't know it but they were they were saying that I was crazy and I was breaking traditions and how dare I and all this crazy nonsense well now we're two years out from from changing over to you know like initiating the the sweep the shed and it was the best thing that I ever did for the team I mean people carry equipment they coach can I do anything do you need me to grab the balls I mean they they just pitch in and it's so it's such a it's just so healthy you know there's no oh I've been on the team three years or four years or, or whatever and it it's it seems so simple and so just minimal but it it works it absolutely works and and I recommend I mean I'll have to put the article on, on my Facebook but I recommend the article I recommend the book and and it was it was a fantastic thing to do, and it, it's worked for me. So if you can use, use it to, to share your or to impact your own culture, I, I highly recommend it. Kudos to you. You're creating a, a selfless accountability. The teammates are all accountable to each other. It's, you're not doing the things you do for you. You're doing them for the whole greater good. And so if you drop a ball, you let your teammates down. I love it. Love it. Yeah. So that – that kind of opens the book, The Legacy, and what what are, what are some other things in the book that stood out to you, Reed? Uh, two of the biggest ones that stood out to me were go for the gap and pass the ball, the idea, and you just talked about it a little bit with, going, with changing. Go for the gap is this idea that we're constantly asking questions of ourselves to get better and that we're not afraid to well, go for the gap, that if you continue to do things the way they've always been done, you'll never change. I'm, I'm sorry that the enemy of progress is just is the status quo and so that's one of the most dangerous phrases we have in in human language is well it's always been done that way uh you know i mean blockbuster thought it always had been done that way too and where are they yeah <laughs> so out of, out of business. It, yeah exactly it's, so it's it's you know it's it's this idea the idea of go for the gap is this idea that you should always be asking questions evaluating what you're doing analyzing what you're doing and looking to improve and change and the biggest time to go for the gap, which is what blew me away in Legacy, was when they said, when you're at the top of, their, of your game, that's when you should go for the gap. Yep. And here are the All Blacks. 113 years or 14 years in existence, a 70, 70 now 76, I think, percent winning rate over 100 years. The faces have changed. The owners have changed. The, or, you know, the, the administrators have changed. The coaches have changed. Even the fans have changed. The venues have changed. But the winning still happens. And yet in 2010, this was a team that was on a downward, for them, a downward spiral. They were still the number one sporting program on the planet in 2010, and they revamped everything. They went for the gap and revamped everything. And then the other one is, you and I were uh, texting back and forth about it earlier, is the idea of pass the ball, and that's commander's intent. When we work with our organizations, you as a, a director of coaching, you've got the right people on the bus, you've got these great values, you've got this beautiful purpose that everybody's going to buy into and they're going to share or they're going to leave and that's okay if it's not their purpose but the people that'll stay that's their purpose and then what you do you've given them intent the why is your commander's intent and then you step back and you let them figure out the how 
And that's, that's where the All Blacks really, are, it's masterful to see that they, they pass the ball. They stop leading from the, the coaches, and they start letting the players become the leaders because when it's in the heat of the battle and the game itself, the coaches can't do a thing, just like in war. It's not the general that makes the decision. It's the foot soldier. As long as you give them the why and the resources and you plan, you've got to let the players figure out the how. Yeah. And, and that's pass the ball. Yeah. And that, and that's, that's hard to, I mean, that's hard to do as a coach. It's, it's, and because I think a lot of coaches, okay, they have, they want their structure. They want to be in charge of the practice. They want to be, you know, everything has to be perfect. And, and, you know, it's, it's that direct, you know, com- that command style. And, and I think once we allow ourselves to take a step back and say, you know what, if the players are, you know, let's see what happens if I throw the balls out and the cones out and I tell the players, hey, set, set, set up an activity and you sit there and wait and, and see what they come up with. And that's okay. You know, I, I, think, I think as coaches we need to realize that we're not, we don't have to always be the boss all the time. <laughs> so, you know, what's funny is I, I stumbled upon that when I was coaching high school. Um, I had a very intelligent senior class one year and so we created what we called we were talawanda uh, braves so i created what we called the council of the nation and it was leaders that were that you know were did, uh, voted on by all their peers to be this council and they started making more decisions and handling pre games and like that and so i was working with a u12 boys team that was one of the most it, it's one of those groups where you just say i got the heck out of the way because these these were some sophisticated young men and so I used what I'd learned with a high school team a couple years later with this U12 team. We started, I started letting them run their halftime. So they'd come in at, during a game, and I'd hand them the whiteboard, or I'd take the whiteboard with me, whichever, and I'd say, all right, you guys have five minutes. And then I would go off and sit, and parents would take pictures and laugh because I'd be 10, 15, 20 yards away kneeling or, or crouching, writing on my whiteboard the three things I wanted to work on or the one thing we were going to change in the second half or the one thing we did well that we're going to continue to do. And then I'd call the captains over, and the captains would give their advice, and then we'd go back, and as a team, we'd say, this is what went well, this is the adjustment we're going to make, that's, so that's your why, go to it. And we start, I started, the kids started asking for more. Can we run our own practice? Can, coach, can we come up with our own formation? Coach, can we, and I, well, yeah, I mean, it's your game. I, I, got, I just have to sit on the sidelines, so you, what do you want? It got to the point where they started running the warm-ups, running games, everything, and I'm standing there during a state cup game, and and we're running a certain formation, and my central midi comes running over and goes, Coach, it's not working. They're this, this, and this. Can we move to a such and such? I said, yes, yeah, next dead ball. And he goes out, and there's a dead ball, and he's like, you go here, go here. We're going to do this, we're going to do this. And, blah. and I stand there with another guy, and he goes, did, did they just change the, the formation mid-game on their own? I said, it's them. Yeah. <laughs> it's them. And you know what? We fell down. They made mistakes. There were games where I was like, oh, man, I probably should have maybe coached them a little bit more. But in the long run, imagine what that does for them. <laughs> yeah, the long run. And I think that's the key, that's a key little sentence there, the long run. You know, th- that one game along the way doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of everything. It, it's, it's the long run. And that yeah. – I think I think as a American culture, that's where we struggle with it because I think we've become such an instant gratification type culture that parents and players they're like, okay, what do you, what have you done for me lately? Or you know, it, it's always this 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 one game and or this one you know season and and it's again trying to educate about you know it's a long term player development plan and you have to have patience and you have to go through the peaks and valleys and you have to be able to endure the crap times to put it you know bluntly in order to to gain the success because you know the 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 thing that drives me nuts is the club jumping that goes on within our youth sport environment and you know I grew up I grew up in the Midwest I played for one club my whole life and you know we had our rivals but I never in my life thought about trying out for the other clubs you know I was I was what I I was what I was with my friends with my teammates 
and there's no there's no way that I would have tried out for another club. And oof, I don't even know yeah. if I'm trying to change that. I'm trying to change that, but I don't know how how we fix that club hopping mentality. Got any ideas? <laughs> I, I know. I struggle with it too. I was like you. I, I played for one team, and I years and years with the same group, and it did wonders for building the culture. But it also created so many great memories. And now it's like, like you said, it's when you were talking about it. The thought that popped into my head was, yeah, parents will give it one season, and if they don't get the results they want, not what their kid wants, the right. results they want, right. uh, you know, us adults using our children as chess pieces, um, then they move to another club, and. I, 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 the only advice that I, I don't know how to stop it, but the only thing I always tell parents is, I, I, you know, evaluate a club not on wins and losses and coaching licenses and those things. Evaluate them on values and mission. What do you want for your child, you know, 30 years from now? Because you're making decisions that are affecting your child based on what he's going to get 10 weeks from now or she's going to get, you know, two seasons from now. And that's we've got to start thinking about this whole idea of echoes, you know, and, and it's, what are we, what are we doing for our children? That's going to matter when, when life actually happens yeah. because right. I mean, that's what sport was for us. you you and I sport was a vehicle to learn the values and the cultural beliefs and the, and the, the work rate and, and all those other pieces and have influences that made us better human beings. Yeah. And I, and uh, I, I have an idea for one of my upcoming radio shows. I want to bring in players and ask players questions and get their opinions because I almost feel as if all of us adults keep preaching over and over what's best for the kids, and and I really want to hear from the players. And I like I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out what age or you know I think my high school girls might be be good but i think it would just be awesome just to interview players and ask them what they really think what do you what do you want do you want to do you want to play high school do you want to you know try out for the da do you do you want to go to different tryouts do you want to stay with your club do you like your coach you know what what are you looking for because i think that those answers i think would be really 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 interesting rich i'm telling you it would be rich and and so that I'll talk a little bit about that aspect at my talk at NSCA about how when we start building our mission and our values, we need to include the players because they're really what we're there for. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, it, you know, it's, have you ever read Amanda Visick's work? No. She's, uh, oh my gosh, she's a researcher at Vanderbilt University, and she did research on this whole idea of fun because everybody started defining, you know, saying that, oh, kids just want to have fun and it's why they sport and it's why they quit. And, and of course, there are all those detractors out there that were, you know, trolling people like you and I saying, you're just making our kids weak. You're, our next right. generation is a bunch of weak little wimps because of you and your safe space there because all you want to do is have fun. And <laughs> so Amanda Vistick said, you know what, I'm going to defend <laughs> some of these people out there who are trying to do it this way. Right. She went out and did research and asked tons of children what fun meant for them. And here's what's crazy. We as adults think fun is, oh, you're just a bunch of weak limbs. You just want to hold hands and sing kumbaya. No. To children, fun was competing. Fun was learning something new. Fun was being challenged. Fun was being with your friends. Fun was socializing. Fun was um, – uh, playing sports, fun was, it was like there were 51 different ways or 50 different ways that children saw fun. Winning was one of them. It wasn't the primary one, but winning was one of them. And so it's, it's you know, nobody ever asked the kids, but right. the kids just want to have fun and nobody asked them what fun meant. Well, there's a man, you know, check out Amanda's work because it's really cool because she did exactly what you're talking about. She asked the kids, what do you want? And, and I think the answers would surprise a lot of coaches, to be completely honest. <laughs> it it really would. It really would. There were there were kids that said, you know, fun was being challenged to learn something new. Fun was winning. Fun was losing sometimes. Fun was, yeah, it's pretty cool. I think it would surprise a lot of coaches what fun really means to kids. Yeah. Well, I, we're, I'm trying to make it fun. Keep it, keep it fun because then when you're working hard, they don't really realize it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! I I was watching your videos, like I told you earlier, of, of your practices and, and your players having a blast. And and like, you know, I always tell the parents when we're at soccer shops and we're playing games, I always turn to the parents and say, "I'm tricking the children, ha ha ha!" Because 
they think they're just having fun, but they're actually learning something while we're doing this. How crazy is that to use play as a way to teach? Wow. Yeah. And the parents always just laugh. <laughs> you know? You're like, it's revolutionary. You should try it. <laughs> yeah, because it's what we did when we were children. Why aren't we letting them do that? Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, there's a, in the book, Legacy, uh, again, I keep plugging it. Is I I have highlighted it like twelve shades of orange because it's it's so good. One thing, uh, w- one of the big things that stood out to me was they kept talking about leave the jersey in a better place. Oh my gosh, yes. Like leave the jersey in a better place, and so like I started to think about that. I was on a run yesterday, and I started to think about that of. of within you know my soccer career history like what what did the jersey mean to me at each step along the way and like I go back to my time I played soccer at the University of Michigan and I was there at a time where it was you know kind of title nine was taking hold and we went from a club sport to a varsity sport and there was all this you know drama because they were going to drop a men's sport and yada yada but like I was so tied to my number and my jersey and what it meant to be that team. And, like, even today I look at it, you know, I look at my friends that I that I know within soccer and it's, I look at some of their email ad- addresses and we all have, like, our soccer jersey numbers somewhere in an old email address. <laughs> like, I was CR Taylor 4, you know, and, and I look at that and it's crazy. As a coach, I do it today. I look at players on my teams that I have. Who, who's wearing number four? Do they, do they have the qualities that I had? Like, it's this crazy thing that I do. And, and I, like, I, I feel attached to that number and to that jersey still. And it, it's, I don't know. Like, and I, I don't know if I'm, like, over the edge and, and just a weird person or if other people feel that way or, or you know, feel that strongly. So, so you want to hear something funny? Sure. Uh, my wife, right before I married her, of course, I, I knew this before I married her, but I told her right before I married her that one of the things I loved about her was that her birthday was on uh, September 16th, and that 16 was my jersey number. There you go. She's a, <laughs> so, she's a keeper. She's a, she's I mean, a keeper. I'm sorry. I'm with you. It's, it's what you do. You obsess over that. And the All Blacks took it to a whole new level. It's like when you pass that jersey, that number to the next person, is it going to be torn and, and, and stained and bloodied, or are you going to pass it so it's so much better for them? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, lo- I really loved when they were talking about that the, the whole add to the legacy. So I, I've been talking about the 100-year echo, and I was so proud of myself because I came up with this. We're going to create a 100-year echo. Something I say or do or we say or do today four generations from now is going to echo through somebody else. We won't even be on this earth anymore, but we will have created that much of an impact that a hundred years from now, something we do will echo. And that, that is a mission. And then I read that line where it says the all blacks had a great mission. Add to the legacy. I'm like, ah, you beat me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You're like, you started it before I did. I thought I had an original idea. Darn it. it. I was trying so hard to have an original thing. Yeah. And, and that's the thing, I mean, I think that's the thing is, you know, within soccer or sport or, or whatever, it, 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 there aren't a lot of original ideas. It's, it, it's like you, it's all collaboration and sharing and picking the, the key things that, that, you know, you can learn from other people that think the way that you do. And, and that's, that's a, the other thing that bothers me about you sport today is everyone, it's like, everyone's so protective of, of what they do and their players. And it's like, oh, this is my club and my team and da da da. And, and there's not a lot of collaboration going on and not a lot of like, okay, well, how do you solve this problem? Let's, you know, let's discuss how you handle this and let's work together and not, you know, you can compete still, but like st- still collaborate and try to be, be better for the kids in general and, and create, cultures that that are friendly and, and like user friendly i guess i don't know there's not a lot of collaboration i guess is what i'm trying to get at the long and the short of it i'm totally with you and then we always do it at the uh you know we, we end up doing that at the expense of the child and it's like why are we here i mean shouldn't we be I mean, if our mission is the children then shouldn't we be sharing with each other hey i have this great new way to teach children or hey i have this great new 
whatever it is because it has this great result for the kids. And I don't, my thought is always two things. One, if a play, if I'm hiding my players from me, if I'm wrapping my arms around saying they're mine, they're mine, you can't have them. Look, if they're going to leave, they're going to leave. They just weren't part of the, my culture or it was time for them to move on. Like, so, you know, we're all climbing our Everest. And right. you may go to the you may go to the summit with me. You may make it to a base camp and then say that's my mountain over there. Best of luck. I hope I gave you the resources and tools you need to go climb your mountain. Go do your thing. If you're going to leave, you're going to leave. I'm not going to stop you, and it's not fair to you if I try to stop you. And from the perspective of sharing, look, if I share something with you and you're good enough to implement it and beat me, kudos to you, brother. Kudos to you, <laughs> or sister. sister. Because, or sister. Yeah, there exactly. You go. I, I got it you in got there. It kudos in there. Good to job. you. <laughs> you know, it's like. I'm, and again, I'm going to turn around and learn something from you. It's like, okay, so you beat me, sister. Can I? Can, can you give me a little bit of advice about how you beat me so I can try to beat you? Know, and kudos to you. Right. Oh, I, I don't know why we ha- we can't collaborate more. We can't help each other more. It's like you and I talked about your club. Anything and anything you need, please let me know. I know I didn't make it up tonight because we're launching all of our demos this week, so it's crazy. But anything you need at, at Laguna, let me know. Right. I'm happy to help you because listen, if you succeed in your mission. I've succeeded in mine. Right. So it's a win-win. Yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, I think that's part of, I keep going back to getting the like-minded people together to like beat the drums and change the world and, and, and make sure that, that we're rebuilding the broken systems. And, and you had mentioned to me in Cincinnati that I think you created your own club and that, by doing things within a certain culture, you were still able to be successful with the quote unquote like big dogs out there. Talk talk to <laughs> me about talk to me about that a little bit because we we have this you know similar Cincinnati Cincinnati contacts and I kind of know I I kind of remember the club the club system there a little bit. So talk talk to me about what you did there. Sure. I actually didn't create the club. They were there. They're actually one of the oldest clubs in town, but nobody had ever heard of them. They didn't have a really good story to tell and, and brand uh, out there. And they weren't, they, they had this phenomenal little culture values, all that, but they weren't, they, they just needed somebody to drive the bus. It's, and it's funny you use that thing yep. from John uh, Gordon, because that's what I did. I told him when I came in, I'm just going to drive the bus. You guys were already on it. Uh, but I was at, I, I was at some large clubs in Cincinnati and I loved it. And I had some amazing players, amazing teams, amazing colleagues, but my mission was just slightly different and, and it wasn't better or, or worse. It was just different. And I, I, I fell in love with this club because a friend of mine, uh, from high school was at the club and he says, you know, we, we started talking about something. He was picking my brain about culture and, and building, you know, culture within my coaches and all these other things. And I started looking into his club and I was like, I want to be a part of that. So I went to this club. And that's the club where I, I spent a season getting to know the coaches and the players and the parents, and I was doing things like extra replay sessions and extra training sessions and uh, coaches' clinics. We revamped the coaches' clinics so they were less about skill and drill, and they were more about these soft skills. And, and then I started asking, well, what do you want? What do, what do you, why do you play? Why do you coach? Why are you here? Well, it was a almost primarily volunteer-driven club. I was the only paid employee. Wow. And then we had some paid coaches. But I was the only paid full-time employee, and uh, I was here. I was out on the field every night with them, out at the games. I went to as many games on the weekends as I could, and every time I watched them, I had my little notebook because I'm a geek, and I was writing down values I saw. Yeah. And then that's hey, after. Yeah. Sorry. What here, were you say? Yeah, I don't mean to cut you off, but we have to go to a quick two-minute break. So hold that oh, no thought. Problem. Hold that thought, and we'll come right back. Right back in. Thanks, Reed. <laughs>
This is chaoticradio.com. Welcome back to chaoticradio.com. I'm Carrie Taylor, your host for Women Talking Football, and we have Reed Maltby still on the line. So, Reed, we were just discussing your time at a, one of the smaller clubs in Cincinnati and, and how you made an impact there and were able to be successful against some of the quote-unquote big, big dogs. So keep, keep going with, with what you were saying. Oh, sure. Uh, so <laughs> long story short, we, we read – we took the values that the club was already living and breathing, and we just basically uh, rewrote them, said, here's, here's what we stand for, here's our mission. And our mission was all about, we're going to create better men and women who just so happen to be pretty darn good soccer players, too. We're going to use soccer as the vehicle. Right. And uh, we started, so my biggest fear was, how do we make those values real, tangible? Because they're just vague, and especially the children especially like eight, nine, 10 year old kids, they don't get what integrity is or, so what we did is we, I copied friends of mine, um, Bobby, uh, Bobby Papioni at, at CU and I used to, and I picked it up off of him. And I think he got it from Barcelona, but we used to require certain things, habits from our players. And so we started looking at the values that star had, which mm-hmm. was the club I've had. And, um, I started taking, uh, those values in attaching these habits of excellence, like brushing your teeth. I tell my boys, listen, you get up, you brush your teeth every morning, it becomes automatic, it becomes this habit, and out of it, out of these little things you do every day, yeah. you build it, excellence, Making right? your bed, making your bed. Make, That's a making big one. your bed, right? Yeah. yeah, you know, clean your desk before you work, and the brain is clean. It's like all these little habits. Look people in the eyes when you shake their hands, you know. So we attach these habits to values. So, for instance, we always shook the referee's hand. That was a sign of respect. We went over and thanked the parents after games. That's a sign of gratitude. We lined our bags up before games and pulled up our socks and tucked in our jerseys because that's a sign of discipline. And so even in, pre- in training, we started to you know greet your teammates, look them in the eyes and greet them. At the end of every session, shake your coach's hand and say thank you for a great session, coach. Right. These become habits of, these habits of excellence now are the daily um, existence and manifestations of the values. Well, the kids and the parents and the coaches – Again, they already had this stuff. We just added habits to them, bought into it. And everybody was engaged and everybody was on mission. And, and it was like they were so engaged. It was almost primarily a volunteer club. And I'd hold a coaching clinic. And I, I had 29 teams at one point at the beginning. And I would have 27 of 29 teams represented by coaching staff. With, I would have more coaches at coaching clinics than players to demonstrate. With volunteer coaches? That's, pretty, with, that's impressive volunteer coaches and so i would sit down with them and say this is your club this is you all i'm doing is taking a big old spotlight and shining it on you and then getting behind the wheel and driving this bus guys and and ladies i mean we're gonna run with this all right so um a year goes by and a good buddy of mine texts me and says i don't know what you're doing at star he used to coach with me, and now he runs Jenga Touch. John Caldwell, phenomenal guy. My buddy, my buddy John. Yeah, you know Johnny. John oh and my Derek. Gosh. He's such an awesome. John and Derek are such awesome guys. Love and Jenga them. has taken off. I keep bugging them. They need to bring Jenga to the to Southern California. I wanted to uh, bring them out to do a camp because they oh gosh, they used be to so be great. volunteer assistants for me for a year at Mount St. Joe. So love them. They are awesome guys. They're and they're doing so many great things. They actually stepped away from coaching full time to run Jenga, and it is. It is brilliant. They're sending kids to the national football team. They're going out and winning international competitions, which, again, it's not about winning, but it's what they're creating. These kids are phenomenal, fearless, uh, risk takers, analytical. It's just phenomenal. Anyway, Johnny texts me and says, I don't know what you're doing at Star Buddy, but people are talking about you. The little club that nobody had ever heard of, all of a sudden, they are not only like on everybody's radar, but they're beating the big dogs. And I said, that's because culture eats talent for breakfast, my friend. You know, it's, right. And there were. There were games where, you know this, man, in the heat of the battle, if you can't keep a blue head, if you can't yep. stay on mission, you will get eaten alive by a team that will fight for each other and fight for that mission, that why. And that's what our teams are doing. And so I show up at State Cup the one year to follow one of my little teams up there, you know, and I'm up at State Cup, and, and it's, I'm buddies with all the other big clubs in town, and right. I'm up there with all the big clubs, you know, the – 
the two biggest clubs in Cincinnati basically win all the state cups on both the men's and women's side. And, and all, they're all looking at me going, what are you doing here with stars? Like, I got this team up here, man. They're, they're in the state finals. Right. <laughs> and like, you're not supposed to be here. You're like, yes, I, said, I Don't am. tell them that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. My kids believe, man. My kids believe. So it was really cool because King's Hammer, uh, another big club out in town, yep. um, the executive director and I were, were close buddies, and and the uh, president of King's Hammer went to school with, at, went to the same high school as me as well. They started talking with me. They're like, what are you guys doing? Let's, let's share notes here because you guys are doing it the right way. That's collaboration. So we, That's amazing. Yeah. And within the soccer uh, world, imagine that. <laughs> It's utter brilliance, right? And, then of course, I've got some buddies, David Robertson over at CU. He and I talk a lot and share with each other. But it's like um, we just started sharing. Uh, and, 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 and I said to, you know, to Dave McIver at Kings and to Tim Bronfo, I was like, so why do you care what we're doing? And they said, because you're doing it right. And we don't care how small you are or how big we are. We want to align with the people that are doing it right. And it's like, we, I won. We won. I mean, yeah. this is, we won. You know, the John O'Sullivans and, and the Carrie Taylors and I and the Eric Imlers and all, we won. Right. <laughs> so, um, and Star's still doing really well. I, I check in with them pretty regularly because when I left, I said, look, my, my mission is altering. I mean, my mission, I got I to gotta keep climbing my Everest. And, you know, seasons change, and, and you, this is sometimes people come into your life for a reason, and they move on, and, and this is happening. But I told him, I said, I feel confident that where this club is, it doesn't matter who is at the helm or who's standing on the sidelines. You have such a great culture that this club will flourish for no matter what. And I said, and that means as a board and as coaching, coach staff and all everybody and parents and kids, you've done it right if you can flourish no matter who is your executive director. So I moved on, and they're still doing well. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. I, I love that story because I know a lot of the names that, that you've thrown out there and, and I know I know the dynamic and, it, and it's great. And, you know, it keeps coming back to that knowing your why and, and getting the right people, the right coaches on board. And, and um, I just I want to share a thing that I did within my club this year and it was scary and I was nervous and I didn't know where it was going to go. But it was it was very, very educational for me. I. Um, I worked with a friend of mine and I created a survey for my coaches and it, and all the questions were value based. So it talked about trust. It talked about happiness. It talked about, um, respect and, and different things. So I sent my coaches this, you know, anonymous culture survey. And I was like, please, you know, please take the survey. And there were a couple of open ending questions at the end and, and, um, I have 17 coaches and 15 of the 17 did it. So I was like, okay, that's a, that's a decent sample. And I was so nervous to look at the results, but I wanted to know, okay, what are my coaches thinking? What's important to them? You know, how happy are they? Do they trust me? What can I do better as a director? And the information that I got back from them was so amazing and important because now I was into their brain and it wasn't me you know, it wasn't me sitting at a staff meeting saying, we're going to do this and here's what I want you to do. It allowed me to see into their brains a little bit and, and take the feedback from my staff and figure out, okay, where are we at? What do they believe in and where can we go with this? And, and it was, it was awesome. And and that's part of what I'm going to share in my talk at the NSCA convention is the results from the survey and the types of questions to ask your staff, because I want other people to utilize the tool because it was so it was it was so amazing to get the feedback and and it's it's driven me to you know create our 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 mantra of our club of being a thriving community-based learning center and it was you know tied in with the survey and, and just asking my coaches hey where are you at what do you want what do you want me to do better what can we do better as a team love it I love it if you sur- a, a, a great leader will surround herself with others who can lead and with others who can step up and make those decisions that need to be made or who can create their own how. If you give them the mission, right? If you give if you give Luna, you Laguna United the mission, then they'll figure out the how, right? They'll figure out how to climb that mountain. Yeah. It, I, it was a little it was a little it was a little scary to like ask people their opinions. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> do I really do I really want to know what what's in the minds of my staff, but it, it was it was really good for me and one thing um, there was one quality there was one thing that they um, 
scored me low on, and it was their, they, they didn't feel um, as connected to, to me as a DOC as they could. So I was like, okay, you know, how do I fix that? So I set up individual meetings with every single one of my coaches in a like low key environment. I took them to coffee, took them to lunch, you know, grabbed a drink with them, and we talked about them. And it, it, I was like, this is your meeting. What do you want to talk about? Let's, you know, talk about where you're at. What do you, what do you want to do? What's your career plan? And it was, it was awesome. And I, now I feel like so connected, more connected with my staff. And I feel like it, it like we turned a corner, you know, and that's, that's exciting to me. So. That's awesome. So I, I gotta, I gotta throw another book at you because this will really resonate with what you're doing with your staff right now. There's a book out there called uh, the Alliance by Reed Hoffman, who was uh, is founder and CEO of LinkedIn, who is founder and CEO, CEO of LinkedIn. LinkedIn. The Alliance? Um, okay, I'm writing it the down. The Alliance. <laughs> it's, so we just read it, uh, Soccer Shop nationally read it, and then we went to the West Coast or the West uh, Western Region uh, meeting with all the franchise owners and, and executive directors, et cetera, and, and, and worked through it. But the whole concept is that, uh, to boil it down into one sentence is, business has changed and the relationship between employees and employer has changed to the point where it's no longer uh, that you work for us for 50 years and we give you a nice watch and stability and you know health insurance it's more of we're going to create an alliance and if you look at silicon valley that's exactly what it is you're going to work for me and it may let's use the the everest uh, analogy we're going to climb everest together and you may only make it to a base camp and then you're going to see your own mountain but while you're here I, we want to know what it is you want to do here to make you a better person so that you're either indispensable for our organization or you're indispensable at whatever mountain you climb next. Right. And so let's work together to give you those tools, the knowledge, the resources, et cetera. And Silicon Valley started doing it because they had what they call job hoppers every couple of years. You change your title on LinkedIn in Silicon Valley and you get five job offers that day. Right. The book. So – what happened was they created these alliances with employees. Some employees would stay. Some employees would leave. But when they left, they were alums. And so they'd go create these other startups. And then guess what? They'd come back and do business. So that's why you see like Google and Facebook and, and all these other companies soaking up other startups because it's former employees of theirs going out, creating new startups and coming back and either being bought back or doing business together. Right. And so it's this, we have to stop thinking of, our coaches on our staff is just these pawns we use in our greater mission. We have to start breathing the mission into them and then saying, hey, what do you want to be? Like you just said, hey, what do you want to be? What do you want to ask? What's the, the best interview question I ever heard was in the book? And the, and the interview question is, what job will you have next after you leave LinkedIn? Right. <laughs> yeah. And so if you're connecting with your coaches and creating this alliance, they're either going to stay, which is great, or, Harry, they're going to go on. And because you, you – set the mission correctly for them, you gave them the right values and the tools and resources, they're going to go fulfill the greater mission of what's best for the children in sports at some other place, and they're always going to be an alum of yours, right. a collaborator. you got to read it. It's really cool, and you got to get your staff to read it because it's, it's a really cool book for understanding why we're doing what we're doing as, a, as an organization, coaches and DOC and board and all that. I, I'm I'm in I I I'm in you you re recommended legacy I'm writing down alliance I, I, I'm reading I'm reading it and yeah and that it, and it's mentioned in legacy as well about leaders creating leaders you know yes. and, and that's you know that for succession planning for you know like it, it's so important to not just go okay here's my staff and you know, here they are and, oh, this person doesn't do this or this person doesn't do that. It's like, hey, it's it's my job. If I'm the boss, I have to empower that person. I have to build them up and, and you know, enhance what maybe isn't currently in their wheelhouse and teach them, just like we teach the players, teach them how to be better, you know. Teach them how to have conversations with parents in a better way. Teach them, you know, how to... Um, if you know if they struggle with organization teach them how to to be a better organizer not just okay how do you play a you know a 4 3 3 and what are you know how do you break down this defense and la 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 and and that's where you know all the soft skills that we keep talking about are so important for coaches and for DOCs and even for our boards to understand cuz 
you know, a lot of us in, in clubs, sometimes the boards change and you have a different dynamic each year or every couple years. And, and you know, if, if the board doesn't understand what, what you're creating with your culture, then you're in a little trouble. <laughs> you, have yeah. to, you have to, you know, you have to teach the board, you have to educate the board as well and keep keep reminding them of, okay, here's our club why. And if, if the board wants you as a DOC to do something that's anti your why, you know, as a DOC, you have to be able to be strong enough to stand up and say that, Hey, that's not us. Like that doesn't, that doesn't, that's not in line with, with what we're about. And that, and that's hard. That's a hard, hard thing to do. in, in this job situation sometimes it is. And, and, you know, I'm glad you brought a board because that's <clears throat> a lot of times what our board ends up being is it's, I, it's, it's, typically parents in the organization who are trying to do what's best for their child. Uh, and, and, and sometimes it, the waters can get a little muddy in, in, in that situation. Um, you have to be very careful. But I'm hoping Ruth Nicholson actually addresses this with some of her U.S. soccer youth symposium stuff right. about we have, to be, we have to consider how we build our board because the people on your board should be your brand ambassadors and your, and your cultural and, and values icons of the organization. They should be the ones who are beating the war drums while you're driving the bus. And so they don't always have to support you, but they have to be on mission with us. And right. if they're on the board so that their child is on the top team or so that they can advance their agenda or put it on their resume or whatever, then they're not helping their child right. or the organization. Um, so I'll tell you a really cool story about the, uh, you said it, you know, where this is not what we are as a club. Mm -hmm. When I was at Star, this is this shows you the culture it was. I'm at a, a game, and I get a text from uh, from one of my board members who says, uh, we just had something happen at one of our other games that you need to know about. Um, apparently, some new parents to the organization were a little harsh on, I'll, I'll just be full, full disclosure, it's my wife who was at a game. Um, I don't know why I was hiding that fact because she's proud of it and I'm proud of her for doing it. But she was at a game. She right. was watching my one son. The games were conflicting. So I was at my other son's game helping coach it. Mm -hmm. And um, she texted me and she's like, I'm going to lose it. These, these new parents on so -and -so, my son's team, uh, they're yelling at the kids. And it's just relentless. And it's like, what are you doing? All oh, that stupid. All, oh, you know, it's like nonstop. Right. And she's like, I'm going to lose it because... It's not. It's counterproductive to what we're trying to do here. And I know they're new to the club, but they're just. They're just nobody's saying anything. Right. So then I get a text from my president of my board that says, "Guess what happened?" <laughs> and then she tells me, apparently she had enough, and she turns to this dad and says, I, "Stop it! Do you like it when you're being yelled at? They're 12 years old. This is not our culture. Sit down and watch the game." And as she put, "I did it in my mom voice. I did it in my mom voice." Well. He sat down. He good, wasn't happy, good. but he sat down. Good. So my board president texts me and goes, bravo, when we have our own parents policing our sidelines to keep our culture the way it is and inducting the new members into our club's culture, bravo. That's great. <laughs> That's great. We, we, need more, we need more parents like that that are willing to, to tell others to sit down. <laughs> They're 12. Well, uh, exactly. I, I guess apparently now that, that they would, that, at the club, um, some parents would get unruly, and and but they, they would start holding each other accountable, or they'd see me coming, and so they go, "Uh oh, the principal's coming." <laughs> right, right, right. So how how do how do we indoctrinate new parents into you know the set club culture? What's what's the strategy there? Because I think that's important. Because I think sometimes we forget as coaches or DOCs. When we get in our groove, we're like, well, we, we just do it this way. You know, is there a systematic way to, to indoctrinate new people? What are your yes. thoughts? Yes, there, there is. Uh, so one is the first thing we ask for is their, for their check. And then the next thing we ask them to do is get the uniform. Uh, somewhere in there, the first thing we should do is either it's a book, it's a video, it's a contract that's signed, it's a meeting. But there's got to be a situation where we actually directly address the parents after trial fun, this is who we are. And that's where like changing the game. We've done that a lot. We've gone out to clubs and we've sent John's book ahead of time to the clubs and said, the parents need to sign a contract or take this little mini course we have online. And it will come out and speak to all of your parents and address. This is what you sports is. But if you as a club are proactively communicating with the parents at the end of trial, before the season starts, this is who we are. This is what we are about. And this is how it manifests. They'll buy in. 
The problem is a lot of times we don't communicate with parents because we see them as the problem or we, we just we want to take their money, but we want them to stand 60 yard, you know, the, on the other sideline and shut up. Right. And so we avoid that communication. And that's where the problems really arise because a lack of communication is when misunderstandings, questions, concerns, they become factoring wounds by the end of the season. And then one person who has a concern becomes cancerous across that far sideline that could have been cured if we would have just set expectations and standards and codes of conduct and taught them ahead of time. This is who we are. This is how we will act. And this is why we are here. Uh, the other way that you can do it is, again, um, we did it at Star. Is we would send out weekly emails. And in the weekly emails, we would talk about our values. We would end the emails with kudos about people who displayed those values, not wins and losses. I mean, I would do that too, but it would be like kudos to such and such team because they displayed such and such value. And anything we did, we reminded them of the values that we had. Right. Uh, and and that was it was eye opening to new parents because they'd come in and they were getting these emails from the coaches or they were getting the emails directly from me that we were talking about these things and that was the other thing I was a little weird you know it, 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 there were at other clubs I probably would have been seen as really crazy but I would send mass emails to the entire club that mm -hmm. would tell them how I felt when the mandates came out I sent a four page email here's how I feel about the mandates here's what we're going to do as a club. Here's how we're going to move forward with it. And whether we agree with it or we don't agree with it, here's what we need to do. Right. And I opened up my heart to them. And as club leaders, if we are willing to be honest with parents, right. be direct with parents, communicate directly with them and be vulnerable to them of like, hey, look, I'm a human being, you're a human being, here's the deal, don't buy in. But you got like you got to remind them there is a system to it. It's those weekly emails. It's the the players of the week are not based on who's the best player. It's based on who's exhibiting the values of the club. The constant reminders of this is who we are. Right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to steal some of that out of your playbook because I I think you know there's there's pieces. There's there you always have to challenge yourself to get better and, and communication is one thing that you know that I I'm trying to work on and I think is important for for all clubs and so I'm I'm taking notes. I'm taking notes, Reed. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what I I learned it from other people. I, I took my notes. So <laughs> Yeah. Um one one thing that that I tried this season and, and I mean hope, hopefully it worked was at the end of the season before we went on our our club break, well, before the season wrapped up, I tried to I set up age group meetings with with all of our age groups so I did you know like boys 2006 your teams need to come to the field at this time and I just stood before like the parents and I said hey just want to check in you know here's the time to complain give feedback like I'm here I'm going to stand in front of you just give it to me what can we do better what do you you know what questions do you have here's what's coming up and I'd, I'd never done that before like before at that time frame and and it, it was good because I, I got to know some of the parents that maybe you know I didn't get to know during the season because we have 33 teams and I tried to make myself as available as possible and tried to go watch as many matches as I could but it was I was like okay let me just try this and it wasn't it wasn't mandatory it was just they were given their time they could show up if they couldn't come to their time they could come to somebody else's time but it was a way just to to be like you know Hey, I don't know there's a problem if you don't talk to me. So here I am standing in front of you vulnerable like you just said and give it to me. I can take it. So it was it was good. I got good feedback um and so it was just something new that I tried that wanted to see where it went. That's awesome. Yeah, no, you're doing it the right way. That's awesome. It's and it's hard because it's hard to open that communication channel because in the beginning people will flood you with information and then and then they realize that, you know, it sort of just, it levels out. But they, they know the fact that they have your ear, that they have an open line to you. It builds a huge trust with them. Yeah. And sometimes parents just want to be heard. I mean, that's yep. the other thing is anytime you get those club leaders who just won't have that conversation with parents, sometimes all they want to do is vent, be understood, be validated, or even not validated, but at least acknowledged in how they feel. Right. And then they're good. It sorts itself out. I had so many times where it was like, Reed, you're the one with tact and you like to talk. So you go talk to this angry parent. And I'm like, oh, great. Here we go. <laughs> and then I talk to the parent. And I, said, I understand where you're coming. I get where, you, where you're where you coming from. I can understand how that is. Let's work through it. And then they're like, all right, I'm good. I'm good. I've right. ended. I'm good. You know, and I go, no, you're fine now? <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
and it hurts. <laughs> you know, I don't like conflict, but right. you know, so you're doing it right. And, and I, I, I hope you keep telling your coaches and your uh, to do that too, to just open that line of communication in the beginning and set the standards. And, you know, the big one is I learned from my, one of my mentors, Paul Rockwood is you tell him, oh, look, I love, I'm, Paul. <laughs> love Paul. He was one of my mentors. Paul. Um, you, you're an architect. And you train to be an architect, and I don't come to your job and say, that wall's going to fall down, you didn't do your job, and I don't stand over your shoulder. So please trust me, because you're paying for me to be your child's coach, right. so you think I am an expert in this, please trust me and don't come stand over my shoulder and tell me how to do my job. I'm, I, I'm happy to have an open, honest communication pattern with you, but you have to trust me as an expert, as a professional. And a lot of times, you set that expectation, they get it right away. Right, yeah. So you, oh, I love Paul. He was the one that taught me to do that. Yeah, you, you talk about, I'm just, I'm going to spin this. We've got a, about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to spin it just a little bit. Talk. You mentioned Paul and, and mentors. Talk to me about who inspires you, who your mentors are, what, you know, what 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 other people have, have imparted on you and made you sure. what you are. Uh, so I had a football coach in, in junior high, Steve Houchin. Um and, and he he was inspirational to me. There was just something about him. He, he had this trust, and he, he treated us like young men and not, you know, 7th and 8th graders. Uh, Paul Rockwood was my high school soccer coach, and uh, he's the one that actually came to me when I was 16 and said, um, I'm going to do something for you. You have a gift, and I want you to share it with the world, and it's going to change the way you see the game of soccer, and it's going to change your life. I want you to be a coach. And so he started me out at 16. Uh, and um, Bobby Kramig. Uh, I went to his camps at Miami University. I went to his camps for years and years and years, and, and my first license was at age 16, and Bobby was the, um, the, the, the teacher. Of the, he, was, he was the instructor of that licensing course, and uh, uh, I've, I've leaned on him over the years for, for all kinds of advice and, and leadership. Sam Snow, when I was going to Bobby Kramig's soccer camps at Miami University, Sam Snow was there because he was coaching at University of Arkansas Little Rock at the time, and so I learned a ton from Sam Snow. Um, and then you just had your peer mentors, like John Caldwell was always a peer mentor of mine. I just I learned so much from Andy Zooks. Uh, oh my god, I know so many... all these people. This is Isn't crazy. It crazy? It's such a small. <laughs> it, there, it's not six degrees of soccer separation. It's like three, three or four. It's it's, it's, in, crazy, it's insane. Isn't it? Yeah, it's insane. Uh, Ian Barker at NFBA. I'm yep. a huge fan of Ian's. I did uh, I did a course with him a few years back, and just really he gets it. He, he really gets it. He gets the soft skills, and he and I have talked a lot, like like you were talking about, about, hey, how can we get some soft skills people at some DOC courses, and how can we do some webinars talking about this, you know, this stuff. And, um, you know, it's just there's it, you. I, I look at anybody that I see as somebody that is doing something the way I, I – it's on mission with me that I know I can learn from, and that if I, if I interact with them, listen to them, um, be engaged with them, that I can really, you know – become a better person but in the beginning that the, the seminal mentors were, were paul and bobby and um and sam and you know yeah so probably some very similar ones to you yeah do you know dr quinn at xavier we talked a little bit about it i so i i knew of dr quinn i i yes i i was at some um I was at some camps, I believe, that Dr. Quinn was at, uh, and and you know, growing up in town, I never actually met him personally, though. Unfortunately, he'll like be, I, be, I never created a relationship with him. He'll be at the convention. I'll introduce you because he's 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 a good he's a good mentor, and and you know, I I had the opportunity to work under him for a couple of years at Xavier, and at the time, I didn't I didn't get it. I didn't get what he was trying to do. I didn't get it. I was dumb and young and thought I knew everything and and now you know it's it's cool to come full circle with with people that you, you know have impacted your life and you can look back and go okay now I get it <laughs> there's yeah. the light bulb it's it's turned on you know so it's always you know we're, we're not where we're at by ourselves and it's always good to to give kudos to the people that helped us get there so exactly do you remember Jack Herman yeah Jack <laughs> Jack's yeah. another one Jack well Still Jack coaching. yeah Jack was at Xavier when I was an assistant there. So his office was across from mine. So I saw him like every day for two years. He's a character. He is a oh my gosh. character, but yeah. Love him. Yeah. He was, he and I were coaching at Cincinnati United 
together for a while, and and uh, I really enjoyed the time spent with him because he just, even to this day, I mean, he's a legend. He and Paul are, you know, Rockwood, and those guys are legends in town, and they still get out and work with the youngest teams, and they still give it their all, and they're never, they never stop learning. He'd come up and watch a session or something and say, oh, I just picked something up from so-and-so. I'm going to use that now. And like, you're Jack Herman. Right. <laughs> you know, you, you're still learning? Yeah. Yeah. Now, Robin Veely was another mentor of mine when I was in graduate school. So I did my gra- first master's in, in sports psych, basically sport behavior and performance at my university, and Robin Veely was there, and she really got me into the soft, science, soft side of, of coaching, really taught me the whole um, um, process of, of how to be a better educator on the sidelines, and I owe a lot to her. Um, so I'm, I'm glad I got to spend uh, two years, in, and I used to live in Oxford, so I would bump into Robin all the time and just pick her brain, like, hey, Dr. Veely, how's, you know, how, how do you do this? And she was a big Coleman Griffith fan and did a lot of research around, you know, Coleman Griffith who wrote the sem, you know, seminal research in coaching education. So uh, that's another mentor I had. Amazing, amazing stuff. So we're getting ready to start wrapping up here. So your talk at the convention, let's just, we'll give a little plug to that again. Friday the 13th. Uh, Friday the 13th, 9.30 a.m. and CC 503 is my Warriors Not Winners culture talk and some of the stuff we talked about tonight. And I've got some, hopefully, some really cool stuff and some techniques you can go back to your club and institute tomorrow. And then at 115 is my Echoes Beyond the Game, and I'll talk about the the Warrior Brain and the. Uh, it's actually seven. I said six, but I added one. There's seven uh, centers of the brain that you can activate with the words used. And I'll give you a hint. For instance, analytical. If you want to build the analytical processes in your athlete's brains, that's the frontal lobe. And so if you want to activate the frontal lobe, one of the things you can do is ask more questions because then you create problem solvers. And so you're at building a warrior brain when you stop giving the answers and you start asking questions of your athletes. And so the whole talk is centered around it starts with this is what verbal abuse looks like. You know, this is what we're doing in coaching, and, this, right. and then this is what we can do differently because it echoes beyond the game. And, and Sam said, I really want you to base it off your TEDx. And then I immediately, I show the dangers. I, I show the science behind what verbal abuse can do and why we need to stop it and how we need to be the ambassadors who go back to our clubs and change the way we speak to our children on the sidelines. And then I talk about the warrior brain. Here's what we can do to build a warrior brain. And trust me, if it works for the All Blacks, It'll work for your kids. Yeah, ex- exactly. I ca- I'm I'm pumped. I can't wait to come come to both your your talks and and I'm so excited that you were on tonight. I, I know we talked about a million different things, but you energize me. You motivate me. You keep me like on my A game. So I really I'm glad we connected and I'm glad you're in San Diego and can't wait to see you at the convention and just keep pushing the right way to do things within definitely your talk saturday right yeah my talk my talk saturday room 504 at 245 it's on managing talent so how to get the right coaches in how to develop them and keep them and push them on when they're ready to fly so i'm i'm psyched to do that it's saturday might not be the best day because people might be worn out but come to it hopefully i'll i'll enlighten you a little bit so um, awesome. We're wrapping up the show. I want to give a shout out to Coaches Across Continents. So check out coachesacrosscontinents.org and also one of um, our sponsors, IntellectStrategy.com. So Reed, thank you so very much for calling in tonight, and would love to have you in the studio sometime when it connects with your schedule better. So um, that sounds awesome. The, I'd love to do that. The uh, invite is there, and um, we'll, we'll make it happen. So. Thanks again for all you do for kids in the game, kids and coaches in the game. Really appreciate it. Thank you for everything you do. Real honor to, to, to work with you and be chatting with you tonight. No problem, Reed. Thank you so much. Chaoticradio.com. Thank you, Mike, my sound engineer. Thank you so much. Oh, great show. Women Talking Football. Check us out next Wednesday.